Yes, uh, thank you so much, Francesca, for your introduction and for inviting also us to, you know, this amazing, very, very interesting uh, endeavor. It seems like, a, you know, four full days of activities there. Unfortunately, we cannot like really physically be with you, but maybe next time, hopefully. And I just realized that the Zoom, which is on my laptop, was not being renamed because we are two of us. And I want to acknowledge that fact. So, okay, now I got Nomeda's okay. name on the screen. So I will try to share our uh, presentation and optimize for video clip. I think that's... I'm not sure. Yeah. So do you, do you see our screen now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Excellent. So responding to your call for turbulence, emergence, and enchantment, uh, we will talk today about the anything you know better than a swamp. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout history, the project of progress and European civilization was realized by draining swamps, marshes, and wetlands. Dividing the land into liquid and solid, butchering the territory for agriculture, waterways, and settlements, extracting and parceling it by expelling the indigenous, are all technologies of progress and of colonization. As Andrew Pickering argues, to notice the swamp below our feet is to switch to non-dualist ontology. That is more appropriate, perhaps, to Anthropocene. We argue that art and architecture must embrace the swamp with its hybridity, complexity, queerness, and paradox as a way to decolonize and to school itself. So this talk will discuss amphibian pedagogy as a method of artistic practice that facilitate new hybrid forms of art and design that help navigate the emergent knowledge and landing on earth. With a short overview of programmatic concepts that drive the evocative landscape of a swamp, this talk will focus on the swamp school, self-organized, open-ended and ever-changing infrastructure that supports collaborative experiments in design, pedagogy and artistic intelligence for learning and adapting to imminent unknowns. So even you did your homework, but I think we will shortly, you know, speak about our background and we are artists, as you know, and also we think we are educators working together and developing research-based practice, which we founded in 1993, long time ago, when we initiated an artist trans space for transdisciplinary research, self-education, self and self-organization. Our interest in collective and organizational forms of art is contingent to the social, economic, and political transition that took place in Lithuania, where we come from. Our experience then as young artists was marked by ecological movements provoked by civic and environmental disintegration brought up by the Chernobyl ecological disaster and the war in Afghanistan. And within this context, we launched our practice pondering on ecological repair as a response to social crisis and considering art as an infrastructure or so-called temporal autonomous, relatively autonomous zone to sustain ecology and perhaps even democracy. We started to reach out to other fields seeking allies for development of new emerging vocabularies that could go beyond representation. In the first part of this talk, we will share some insights unfolded in the book, Swamps and New Imagination. In the second part, we will discuss amphibian pedagogy developed in the Swamp School. And in the last part, we will share some forms of thought embodied in Swampian design. All three parts are interlinked and interdependent, so such partitioning is artificial and made only for the purposes of this Zoom presentation. I have to admit, we intentionally imprecise using the term swamp. Wetlands can have many names, quagmires, marshes, box, fence. However, the term swamp stands out for its irritant subject. In the words of Bruno Latour, 
swamp is a critical zone as it reached the critical state due to the exhaustion as a biotope and it is critical or even irritant instrument as it cries for a change of perspective by standing critical to our modernist ontology. In that sense, it is in line with the proposal of critical zones, which expands our imagination of space by including not only the horizontal, geopolitical and geographical, but also the vertical, geological and cosmological axis into the concept of environment. Long maligned, abused by political rhetoric, drained and extracted for the sake of progress, swamps represent arguably the most uncanny place on earth and the cosmology of modern man. On the way to Inferno, one needs to suffer the swampy, stinking waters of the river Styx and the black goo of the Stygian swamp, in which one can find no joy in God or man or the universe, according to Dante. In either hell or the underworld of tonic powers, it is a miry swamp, not a gentle and soothing fan or bog. The term swamp itself suggests submersion with its connotations of overwhelming muck of waters closing overhead. This dark place, shapeless and limitless, as the universe itself is an abyss into which we steer. The swamp mirrors the depths of our own imagination, illuminating with a ghostly spark like a dignis fatum or will of the wisp. However, however uncanny the swamp is, it is yet stuck in the habit of political rhetoric that calls for mobilization against anomaly and deviation, as seen is uh, in the uh, reiterated refrain of drain the swamp. Drenare la paludia, as we know it from Garibaldi and Mussolini, as they actively terraformed the lands, Italian landscape. Draining, cleansing, and purifying of swamps, getting, getting rid of uh, things deemed queer or witchy, was not only embedded in the project of fascism, but in the rhetoric of modernity as well. The Cartesian mind of the Enlightenment set a tone in scientific classification by filtering and refining idea of useful knowledge that is in service of European civilization, simultaneously separating and discarding all that is muddy, queer, or obscure. Swamps could not fit into that purified classification as they are hybrid and indigenous, a matter that has not yet been tamed and resist taming that dirty, murky, slutty terrain that is neither water nor land. Unless drained, swamps do not lend themselves to extraction. Peaty bogs are fertile of organic compound as is similar to coal, just hidden under the water. Growing extremely slowly, sphagnum moss turns into peat arguably the best carbon sink on the planet Earth. However, the benefits of swamps to bioservices exceeds tropical forests or even oceans. Their values cannot be limited to economic terms only. The swamp's relationship to human settlements is also complex. The very project of urbanization owns its sprawl to the swamps, draining and pushing the swamps to the margins of humanity and humans to the margins of swamps, produces recursivity of swampification and a cyclic contingency of extraction and expulsion, as in the words of Saskia Sassen. The dual ontology of the swamp is the crux of this inquiry, situating the swamp in the center of lineage of visionary artistic cybernetic, cybernetic experimentation, once started by Gordon Pask and Stafford Beers in the 60s. Their insight brings into our attention the interactions of life forms and the modeling of balance that is inspired management of complex processes in human society. The empirical basis of objective science has thus nothing absolute about it. Science does not rest upon solid bedrock. The ball structure of its theories rises above a swamp like a building erected on piles driven down from above into the swamp, wrote Karl Popper in the 30s. Self-organizing systems lie all around us. They are quagmires, the fish in the sea, or the intractable systems like clouds. Surely we can make these things work out for us, act 
act as our control mechanisms, or perhaps most important of all, we can couple these seemingly uncontrollable entities together so that they can control each other. Why not, for example, couple the traffic chaos in Chicago to the traffic chaos in New York in order to obtain an acceptably self-organizing whole? Why not associate individual brains to achieve a group intelligence, wrote Gordon Pask in The Natural History of Networks in the 60s. The cybernetic imaginary of the swamp suggests hybrid interfaces and forms of intelligence which could work to orient us towards landing on Earth, not leaving the Earth. Going deeper into the subject of swamps, it becomes apparent that we are dealing with much more than a metaphor signifying an organized mind. It unfolds as a well-organized biosphere and is a library of diverse artistic, cultural, historic, and cybernetic knowledges. As artists, we argue that swamp is a multifaceted lens through which we can look into the connections and interdependencies not only between the life forms and non-living matter, where we can discover that the complexity of our symbiotic planet as significantly described by the biologist Lynn Margulis, but the, in the assemblages of eclectic sources that are in service of a speculative poetic ontology that sketches possible implications for thinking and acting in the present, as in words of anthropologist Stuart McLean. The technique of the swamp is in active engagement with the material world, as uh, Ursula Le Guin suggested. Here, the chancy, formless, fluctuating, and reliable, and in the end, unknowable matter that shifts between the modalities from solid to liquid, from liquid to vapor, becomes the focus of our attention. The swamp has a history of imagination that represents the place outside the space of culture and civilization, argues philosopher Sabolus, co-editor of this volume. The discomforting topology of wetlands links the problematic identity of being neither water nor land with an anxiety related to its uncanny nature, infested with malaria, miasma, and melancholia. Environmental humanities trace down the feminist locus of wetlands. As the nemesis of the noble patriarchy, wetlands appeared hideous and ghastly, unclassifiable, treated as feminine and mysterious as the womb itself. This is also the reason why, in the Western cultural imagination, wetlands used to be conceived of primarily as dystopian places. One could say that swamp marks the crisis of modern imagination and the reimagining of which we are in dire need in order to begin reorienting the dynamic between space and time. The famous polemics of the Anthropocene and its alternative titles, among the other things, express our failures of representation. For example, our incapacity to conceive of geological temporality on a human scale. In fact, as witnessed by thinkers of imagination from Kant to Sartre, Bachelard, and Simondon, the perception of place is deeply rooted in the techniques of imagination which exercise the translation from time to space. Imagination morphs these moments of juncture and produces a schematics of orientation, which may critically channel new dynamics of inclusion and exclusion. Hence, we would like to conceive the, of swamp as locus of imagination, the place of codependencies and correlations, which have frequently been overlooked. Or perhaps we should even make a stronger claim that the new imagining of the swamp is also an attempt to grasp and express those manifold sympathetic relations that have been left invisible thus far. Swamp can teach us a lot about entangled existence. In this sense, swamp may also provide an interface to Gaia. For example, offer a face, a certain physiognomy to evoke a faceless networks of relations, inviting us to understand and to cultivate the regimes of entanglement that and gender novel models of socio-biological coexistence with non-humans, end of quote. Swamps are slow ecosystems, and thus the swamp book is also a slow process, weaving practices and approaches around the subject of swamp in an effort to unfold the paradox of dialectical tension between the book as both a process of thinking and as a tangible material and printed object. 
The publication is offered as a reader for the many audiences invested in the question of cohabitation in art, architecture, and philosophy. From the interdisciplinary to non-disciplinary ability to engage messy worlds, worlds of mud and other ways of knowing, the book is an attempt to register the perpetual process of swamping as probed in the art and design experiments that we will discuss shortly in the next chapter. The swamp challenge started from the proposal for the swamp school as the form and the school as a form for the National Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennial in 2018, where we probe the concept of architecture developed beyond visuality. Situated in the center of Venetian Lagoon and joined by a dozen of school, sc collab schools collaborators and a number of participants from diverse disciplines uh, and also supported by uh, a group of interlocutors, each uh, supporting uh, one of the chapters of the Swam School. Um, and of course, this presentation uh, doesn't allow uh, to list or to acknowledge all of them. Uh, the school develops pedagogical exercises that engage sensorial, immersive, and embodied knowing to imagine a future learning environment that support emerging forms of learning and urge us towards change of perspective. The first exercise that took place in the school was to take young architects, since it was a proposal for the architecture biennale, to the Augstumala Moor in Lithuania, where German botanist Karl Albert Weber in the end of 19th century and beginning of the 20th century conducted the world's first scientific study on wetlands. Known as the Swamp Bible, this book remained a major source for the science on raised peat box. Following Humboldt, Weber inquired into the dependency of plants on insects, fungi, soil, and air, focusing his observation on sphagnumos cultures. Stationed at Bremen at the Imperial Prussian Observatory of Swamps, he was sent to the outskirts of the East Prussia, present day, of, present day Lithuania, to build scientific foundation for extraction and colonization of swamps. Enchanted by the immersive experience of the untouched wilderness, smells, core sounds and fluctuating ground, he registered the beauty of the landscape by meticulous study of slow growth of plants, queer shapes of trees, optical phenomena like ignis fatum, and he also mourns for the end of prehistoric time sedimented in the pit for the thousands of years. Uh, so maybe we can quickly take a look at this first experience uh, which revisited the Weber's footsteps and engaged in the first lesson of the swamp, uh, the instability. Drawing on archipelagic thinking, the school functions as open-ended and ever-changing infrastructure that supports collaborative experiments in design and artistic intelligence for learning and adapting to imminent unknowns. So it was organized in three main chapters, the Swamp Radio, Futurity Island and Communism, and also all, all of them were reflected in the Swamp Manual which was edited with the students at uh, MIT with the class. And so it was like a supportive material for the school and for the exercises. Uh, it is assembled from the foldable posters, each featuring short essays to discuss pedagogy of the practice, whether it is art or design or theory. Uh, and the form of the manual it allows to disassemble it completely and uh, to disperse it and create a, sp 
spatial library of references where each part is conceptualized through a key, three key essays that engage tensions between the swamp and modernity, the swamp and pedagogy, and the swamp and hybrid practice, uh, where the historic models in art and architecture are being brought to attention as they offer sensorial engagement with the world. As for example, Marianne Amersher, the whole psychoacoustic phenomena that destabilizes modernist notion of production of space and opens up the swamp radio chapter in the school. Here, the space is navigated with means of sound inquiry, where listening with the body plays a role to, and also enables uh, listening to other species, as in the work of Jana Binderen, who engages frequencies beyond human hearing, or Mapuche listening to environment in Venice that is practiced by Nicole Verrier, or listening through the bones and body, as suggested by Sam Aunger. In the next chapter, we all drawing uh, on Juan Downey, uh, who calls himself invisible architect uh, as he is developing uh, inquiry framed as invisible architecture, uh, where he spends uh, in the 60s years in uh, Amazonas and 70s also uh, with Yanomami people observing uh, their daily rituals, uh, the sounds, movements in the landscape they produce uh, to create interaction and communication with uh, other uh, and modern human species. Uh, and and uh, he tries to capture that communication with the help of drawings and also camera that he takes to Amazonas. Uh, and uh, and in, in, in combination, he tries to sort of like reconstruct and capture that invisible world, that invisible architecture. So, so, so this liquidity of the architecture we were like trying to express in the swamp ponchos, uh, where architects' proposals, uh, the architects who were engaged with the swamp school, landed on the on these ponchos thinking of how to embody and perform their own design in a way to recombine exhibition as a representation through performance of projections and ideas about the pavilion. Uh, so swamp ponchos is a basic gear for the human conditions of the swampy research. And uh, worn by the architects themselves, they can reconstitute the idea of a pavilion anywhere in Venice. In that sense, the pavilion is not bounded to the limitations of architecture, but as a swamp itself is constantly leaking its boundaries between national, political, or human on human separations. Another historic uh, evocative figure, uh, Jona Friedman uh, and his concept people's architecture is engaged in the series of workshops that involve children in a creative process by opening space for play and learning through the educational performances that take place during the weekends uh, at the Swamp School. Uh, play shifts children's creativity towards the development of symbiotic environment, amphibian man's house, by recognizing advanced hybrid thinking and Oscar uh, Hansen's pedagogical open form theory is deployed in order to create opportunities to imagine, construct and experience architectural space that can accommodate half human and half amphibian beings. Through the worship, children investigate different aspects of interspecies relationships, new forms of dwelling, and the possible coexistence of different forms of life. So the pipes uh, continue to be like a tool for play or an instrument for playing. A network of pipes presents an artificial skeleton, the channels, what we used to call nature. Following the Berechtian thought, Sonic Void appropriates the pipe as an anthropocenic technology and builds a sound infrastructure that brings humans and non-humans into more symmetrical collaborative relationship 
aiming to transmit the silence vo silent voices of our planet. Uh, in this in this part, let, let's say like this uh, exercise, architectural exercise, we installed the ultrasonic transducers, uh, which which are transforming the drain pipes into the organic reverberating matter, opening free space for swampy and medi mediations meditations. Used as counter utilitarian infrastructure, this installation also becomes a platform for swamp school experiments to scale up. It uses sound as a quaking force that destabilizes both architectural space and the perception of our roles as builders of the environment. Helen and Newton Harrison's uh, and the early piece from the 70s, Making Earth, is yet another reference another role model uh, as uh, their pioneers uh, for the eco art and making of commons and also the systematic thinking where they're looking into how the living systems and also environments uh, living environments can be uh, can be approached by the artists and architects and urban planners and become uh, and become part of uh, of the build environment uh, so the build environments would kind of like uh, borrow the logic of these living systems not to colonize them but uh, but you really find the symbiotic relations uh, so the idea how the engaging this world link on earth uh, uh, is being uh, in inspiration for the community of plants or kind of like looking into the swamp as ecological megapolis where we look back at the swamp to gain different perception of time uh, in, in light of accelerating technological speed, where we can realize that it takes thousand years for a swamp land to be formed. Swamp plants are adapted to slow growth, accumulating value for their healing, cleaning, or antiseptic properties, which are often forgotten or even unknown by our generation. It seems that the swamp encompasses heterogeneous temporalities as well as different systems of knowledge, indigenous or and techno-scientific, pre-modern and ultra-futuristic. The juxtaposition of technological and organic must be reconsidered. Swamp cultivation is always a technological interaction. The courtyards that surrounded the swamp school space in Venice were used to install the plants brought from Augustumala swamp from Lithuania, mentioned, the swamp that was mentioned earlier. Uh, so-called community of plants and supported uh, by water filtration system represents a very complex ecosystem that was to survive a whole period of the Bernale. The swamp scientists from Lithuania estimated the optimal size of the model, approximately 15 square meters, supporting the plants brought from this uh, swamp that is two and a half thousand years to the north with the blocks of peat. It was true experiment moderated carefully during the days of exhibition. By the end of the Biennale, the swamp had many different local species inside its community, but also almost extinct species appearing. Angelo, the farmer who lives in San Erasmo Island and grows artichokes, took the community of plants and replanted it to support the ecosystem of Venetian artichokes after the Biennale. So we revisited the San Erasmo Island and Angelo, who is like now our ambassador of the of the swamp school, and uh, yeah, we saw the plants growing quite nicely uh, some years after the Biennale already. Um, another uh, project, or as we call them, public interface, uh, is by the group of students from Naba from Lana, who investigated the island uh, in Venice Lagoon, which is called Campalto. Historically, this place, a barena, was a garbage spill that accumulated by time and constituted an island. Uh, in the end of 19th century, it was also made into a fortification with the military infrastructure built there, may, uh, which was made obsolete after the World War I yet remaining concrete frame for the ammunition storage. 
So students cleaned uh, that island and turned the bunker into an archive of bizarre assemblages, plastic agglomerates, uh, which they found on the island's shores. As the passing by large ships uh, move the masses of water, the bottom waters and undercurrents transport even bigger pieces of residue and garbage from completely different parts of the lagoon just by time under the water. So Nava Group spent time to investigate and accumulate different hybrid objects and chimeric artifacts and classify them into the archive. Anthropic souvenir Venetian soap was another device public interface developed by MIT students. Drawing on how Catherine Malabou conceptualizes the concept of futurity by exploiting the duality of the French term noting that the expression can refer at one at the same time to the state of being sure of what's coming and of not knowing what is coming. The idea based on uh, an ancient Venetian soap, Saponia con rose, made from the city swampy resources points to the entropic dimension that inherently complicates temporal relationships. It is a souvenir, a factual trace, which combines past knowledge and rootedness in the material hybridity with anticipation of the unpredictability of the future. By reactivating continuous recollection and spreading its multisensoriality, Sapone is still destined to lose its color and scent without the possibility to infinitely generate those memories. In parallel to the thermodynamic system from which we appropriate entropy, the souvenir also undergoes an irreversible process. This object of remembered experience cannot escape time sphere and uncertain effects. The entropic souvenir is an object birthed, morphed, and destroyed by this epoch's very nature. Making New Land by Thomas Pouch Studio is an interspecies conversation with an archaic plant which can be found on the shores of Venice, Salicornia Europea. This non human entity played a great part in the history of the city. It offered the glass artisans of Murano a local alternative to the imported resources of soda ash, an important component, an important component in glass making. Outside of its industrial human use, Salicornia also plays a fundamental role in coastal intertidal wetlands. It creates lands. Emerging from the sea, it roots gathered, they gathered the debris of minerals, shells, sand, and rock particles. Aggregated by cyanobacteria and diatoms, this enriched soil becomes a fertile land for other species to grow. The models on display are visualizations of the soil making activity of Silicornia europea. From material and media experiments, making new land bridges botanical research and human imagination and is part of the larger project, Hallucinary Ecology by Thomas Parr Studio. Communism on co cohabitation and making comments. In the third chapter, we are working with Pascal Gelin, sociologist who believes that the least place where the democracy is still possible is art. He claims that everything has been colonized by the capitalist system, but artists are still managing within the art circulation. Yes, we have art market and capitalism coming into art, but still artists are producing interventions, disobedient acts, and spaces of exception where freedom and democracy are possible, at least for some time. As artists, we are working with space and with public. They can create, as artists are working with space and with public, they can create these spaces of freedom and democracy, in the words of Pascal Guillain. In media, it is not possible. In other human spheres, it is not possible. Perhaps. That's his claim as a sociologist. Uh, so here uh, he is joined by uh, artists and designers like Santiago Sirgueda, uh, Sirugueda and Obreseta Surbanas from Valencia in Spain, uh, that were working with clandestine architecture hacks and interventions, making architecture that is not permitted semi legal or illegal, and uh, thus pushing boundaries of legislation and uh, and uh, questioning uh, the legislation. Uh, and uh, 
in collaboration with Nico Dox, uh, who was also interlocutor uh, along with Pascal Gelin of the uh, communism chapter, uh, who uh, all, they also brought the students from the Anthrop School, uh, Anthrop Academy, uh, the social cooking and eating as part of uh, the commensality experience uh, was organized uh, where uh, the members of this collective uh, were uh, on the daily basis uh, uh, chopping uh, carrots, chopping potatoes, uh, creating the sounds, bringing the sounds of the kitchen of the, of the food making into the, into the space uh, and mixing this with the talks, with lectures, with the with the discourse and with performances. Uh, so mixing the discourse, we, we also brought some attention to modern humans here is a fiction, a project by Icelandic group of architects, uh, anthropologists, uh, activists who are researching the vernacular house in of Iceland. Um, the modernization of Iceland led to a destruction of these type of houses, like a complete destruction, and switched uh, uh, Iceland to the concrete architecture. Uh, it has a lot of geothermal heat, but despite of that, concrete houses uh, get mold due to extreme wind, humid and cold, and cold, uh, which are like the ex no, exceptional free uh, conditions in Iceland. Uh, the system and ecosystem of that tur turf house where soil, different fungi, bacteria, and microorganisms are co-existing, uh, uh, co-thriving, is called turf house microbiome. And the researchers, uh, chemists, calculated what there are like 1,631 bacteria and 697 eukaryote species in the samples of such house. All these different species contribute to the human immune system. So the humans living in the turf house under the extreme conditions that Iceland has stay healthy. And the idea behind the rehabilitation and bringing back Icelandic turf house is a concern about human health. So the turf is so healthy, what you can even eat it. And during the workshop, we were uh, tasting the earth from the big chunk of the turf house sliced like a bread. Considering transformative effect, uh, we make critical or radical pedagogy a core component in our work. Inspired by Paulo Freire and John Dewey, such pedagogy is argued as critical or even radical as it activates liberatory regimes by inviting participants to critically engage with their realities and discover how to participate in transformation of their worlds. What makes it amphibian, perhaps, is the interrogation of the disciplinary as a new way to engage with trans, post, and anti-disciplinary. Building on Perry Nilsson's writing on amphibian, uh, the amphibian is a metaphor that amplifies knowledge produced in art as well as makes the procedure of art visible. The amphibian creature does not survive by moving down to the sea or up to dry ground, but by remaining where it is. It is well adapted to a practical life in the ever-changing ecotone between sea and solid ground. Pernilson describes artistic practice and context as territory between scientific and tacit knowledges, as riparian territory, littoral landscape, as ecotone with ever-changing boundaries. The amphibian is a technique a craft that navigates that littoral landscape without tracing or controlling it. This territory one cannot trace, only map, while constantly being aware of the fact that changes in it will soon render the map obsolete if it is not interpreted in a new way and adapted to the transformed surroundings. So the value of swamps as ecotones and as transitory ecosystems is acknowledged in the public interfaces developed as a way to engage audiences and environment at the swamp school. Um, a swamp cannot be contained. The swamp school also leaks through its chapters, smuggling knowledge between art and architecture and inspiring projects and sites of engagement. So in the next uh, chapter, which became so suddenly very short, we only have like uh, 
seven minutes, we would like to squeeze some uh, design um, iterations, let's say, which directly came from the Swamp School. And one of them is uh, Swamp Intelligence, uh, which is conceived with the uh, um, AI scientist or artificial intelligence scientist, Jonas Kubilius, and which is probing the idea of merging uh, artistic and scientific investigations uh, in a certain form of intelligence. So basically what we are doing here, we are uh, training the AR model, uh, an algorithm, uh, which is uh, generating the white noise and is capable to generate out of that white noise a hybrids of natural, architectural, and technological Im imagery and can you to human perception. Yeah, the project engages metabolism of the ecosystem where muddy and machinic organically merge with digital life forms. The system based on no place neural network, a variant of conditional AI is used to unveil neural network uh, abilities to generate visual imageries that engage modern human worlds. In its constant balance between real and the imagined, this uh, system mimics the dampening counter force effect of the biological swamp. So here, this hybrid ecosystem probes interdependencies of the swamp and the machine learning and renders uh, a thought forms on the architecture that emerges from the sympathetic dreams and modernist nightmares about the swamp. So here it is inhabiting the world of the museum. Futurity Island is like one of the chapters of the swamp school. It also grows into the um, playground or public playground and interface for embodied experience of the environment and its pollution. Conceptualized as a space for acoustic experimentation, the Futurity Island serves as an infrastructure that hosts sound compositions and performances that translate the environmental data into sonic cries to address the structures, uh, historical, metaphoric, and narrative that govern our climate futures. Constructed uh, from pipes donated by the industry in Mississauga, Toronto, as the primary structural and symbolic unit of the island. Uh, it refers to the, uh, the material that has facilitated worldwide land reclamation throughout the modern era. Once used to drain in the swamps, pipes becomes the metaphor for a human-centered ecology and infrastructure of environmental domination and one of the prime symbols of Anthropocene. So yes, uh, it's like an infrastructure to experience there. Do you have some uh, sounds to make? Yes, play? I do have a sound from the blue vinyl. No, if you will hear it, but let's try. I don't know. I don't know if if you guys could hear the sounds, but uh, the sounds uh, uh, are composed in collaboration with Nicola Hulier, Chilean-born uh, musician and composer, uh, and uh, and the blue vinyl uh, is is made uh, from the melted pipes, right? As we try to think. Um, so the Swamp Observatory project, uh, which is uh, continuation of the of the swamp school exercises is installed in the critical zones exhibition uh, and with this work we're responding to Latour's challenge to engage with the critical zones proposition to reconceptualize geography or what he's calling geography. Uh, the epigenetic model we are proposing explores holobiontic relationship between natural cultural material and immaterial nodes raising our awareness of its networked relations. These instruments constitute hybrid artistic scientific model and are designed by merging electronic machinery with recycled peat, 
decomposed and carbonized vegetation and organic matter found in swamps, the most efficient carbon sink on the planet. Through four swampian figures made of peat, swamp brain, biotope model, time stack, olfactory crevice, the swamp observatory calls to recognize poetic powers of the ecologists surrounding us and as altered sensorial organism lures the audience to experience their relationships through sensory immersion and thus experience so-called hybrid knowledge. I think we don't have that much time left. So maybe but you I... know, no matter time in the swamp runs very slowly as That's already true. was observed by Carl <laughs> Albert Weber. But me, I but... hope I hope uh, our audience and listeners uh, could also join us in this uh, in this perception of slow time. So if we still have some time, like a few more minutes, we could like show you the another iteration, which is a swamp game, uh, which we sorry. Is OK? Of course, there are a few minutes. Okay, great. So they developed the swamp game together with uh, uh, our colleagues and members of the MIT Climate Visions Group from MIT. Uh, and the game invites users to experience these poetic relations unfolding in the trembling swamp. Oops, I just want to play the file. So as we discussed earlier, swamp is a perfect milieu to sense the fragile interdependencies between the organisms and the habitat. Here, every member of the community is part of every other member's environment, as well as the necessary for survival of the whole. The game probes the change of perspective and allows us to embody different species by touching swampian creatures, plants, insects, birds, amphibians, fungi, bacteria, or algae, and discovered the main rule of cannibal metaphysics. To become the other, you have to be eaten. So the game experiments with the biotope model of Okstuma Lamor, uh, the one we briefly talked about before, where German botanist Weber conducted the world's first scientific study on wetlands. The creatures dwelling in the game are inspired by the drawings of Weber, as well as informed by the scientific data that is collected uh, with the help of biologists re researching this uh, place further. The swamp game transcends the Darwinian logic of survival of the fittest and offers the user a chance to embody different species and thus change variety of perspectives. Reflecting on the swamp as an ecotone, the game engages with transitional nature of deep listening, chameleonic colors, aberrations of three dimensional space, disoriented pace of movement and chimeric language of the glyphs. The messy and irritant swamp gives us an opportunity to test the, the idea of symbiosis, collectively forming and becoming together in order to find a new ethos, ethos for coexistence, a way that recognizes the poetic and political power of ecology surrounding us. So you can still play the game on the ZCAMS website. Uh, sorry. Um, okay, and finally, the project Swamp Observatory uh, that engages future pond area of new urban development in Visburg and proposes a sentient public space where humans and modern humans meet in a hybrid world of reality and fiction. Uh, the work is commissioned by Baltic Art Center and Public Art Agency in Sweden and is conceived as a set of digital instruments that initially were the quagmire, the swarm, the spawn, the frog army, snake pit, and the time stack. These instruments would invite audience and residents and visitors to this site, uh, to this new uh, urban development, to experience reality that is augmented with the imaginaries of the past, present, and future time, species and materials that perhaps are yet unknown to us. Firstly, Swamp Observatory builds on the network of fictional society 
Society of Forgotten Futures, that is an assembly of experts whom we met during the research trip to Gotland. They have contributed with their local knowledge on landscape, botany, history, and mythology to inform the visualization of the digital instruments. As a next step, we approached Athena primary school pupils and teachers to imagine future creatures monsters inhabiting metal world commons in Beesburg. Remotely, they conducted field trips with biology teachers to experience the site and learn about climate change. Of course, the local uh, stories about local ecology play an important role as uh, Gotland that uh, is geological formation based on the uh, limestone uh, has also uh, the biggest factory in Sweden, the biggest cement factory in Sweden run by the German company. Um, so, uh, of course, these monsters, uh, they are like sponges, they are soaking all the pollution produced by the industries uh, uh, presently, but also uh, all the toxicity and pollution uh, historically accumulated in the, in the Baltic Sea, as the Baltic Sea is uh, notoriously known for as most polluted sea, arguably most polluted sea in the world, you know, given its uh, uh, biochemical weapons uh, dumping at the end of the Second World War and all the agricultural waste and so on and so forth. So uh, later we had remote drawing sessions with the students where they imagined, draw and wrote short scenarios responding to uh, questions we propose them. Uh, then follows the process of translation, uh, where children's drawings uh, are transformed into the three-dimensional characters that uh, are working to develop augmented reality solutions. With the help of AI technology, visitors to the site will immerse into hybrid experience of physical reality and fiction. Being physically present on site or via website on the internet, users will have possibility to explore relationships between species and their roles in the local ecosystem while being immersed in observing, listening, moving through the landscape and employing other senses. We hope that exploration of pragmatic and also fictional exchanges between species and their milieu will help us to envision the future of the local environment and perhaps to experience climate commons. So thank you for staying with us and, uh, and getting into the mode of uh, this slow, swampy time.